To my YouTube listeners, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please subscribe. It'll make a big difference for the Hasidic Story Project. This is the Hasidic Story Project with Barack Holman, podcasting from Jerusalem, Israel. This podcast is sponsored by listeners just like you. To become a supporter of this podcast, please go to HasidicStory.com. H-A-S-I-D-I-C Story.com. You'll never know. You'll never know. You'll never know. You'll never know. I have one long story for you this week because of Tisha B'Av. I don't have as much time to record and edit. I'm sure most people have heard that it says in the Gemara, if the Jewish people would keep two Shabbatot, two Sabbaths, then Mashiach would come immediately. And everybody asks, what does the Talmud mean? Which two Shabbatot is it talking about? And the holy Reb Mordechai of Chernobyl says that the Gemara is referring to the Shabbos above and the Shabbos below. For the Shabbos below, the most important thing is keeping all the halachot, all of the laws of the Sabbath exactly as they're supposed to be. And that's very beautiful and very holy. But then there's the Shabbos above, the light that shines down from heaven that only comes into our hearts on the holy Shabbos. And so for Mashiach to come, we really have to have both the Shabbos below with the Shabbos above. And when we do, Mashiach will come immediately. So here's a story about the Heilig Baal Shem Tov and the neighbor above and the neighbor below. One time the Heilig Baal Shem Tov says to Hashem, what reward would be given to someone who keeps Shabbos in the highest way possible? And so Hashem took the Heilig Baal Shem Tov up to heaven to the highest place in Gan Eden, where even the angels weren't allowed to go. And sitting there, he sees two golden thrones, shining with light coming out of them. And the Baal Shem Tov says to Hashem, Whose thrones are these? And Hashem says, One is for you, if you are wise, and one is for someone else, who you will need to find. And so when the Heilig Baal Shem Tov came out of his meditation, he went straight to his driver, Alexei, he said, prepare the horses. We have to find someone very special. And of course, everybody knows how Alexei would drive the wagon. He would face the Baal Shem Tov, and the horses would ride wherever they wanted, taking the Baal Shem Tov and Alexei exactly to where he needed to be. They traveled for a long time, longer than they usually did, and the horses slowed down. And the Baal Shem Tov looks around. And he sees that they're in a large city, but there are no shuls, no yeshivot, no mezuzot. It's a city where no Jews live at all. And the horses come to the center of town, to the town square, and they stop. And the Baal Shem Tov gets out and he sees there's a restaurant nearby. He walks into the restaurant and he says, Excuse me, you probably know most of the people living here. And the waitress says yes. And he said, Do you know if there happen to be any Jews living in your town? And she says, Yeah, actually. My chef in the back is Jewish. Now the Baal Shem Tov was surprised because this was a non-kosher restaurant. And he went to the back to meet the Jew in the back, the chef. And he sees he doesn't have anything outwardly Jewish about him at all. His head is not covered. He doesn't have a beard or tzitziot. doesn't have peot. And like I said, he's cooking treif. But the Baal Shem Tov understood that this is where he needed to be. And the Baal Shem Tov said to him, my sweetest friend, my driver and I have been traveling for a long time to come and visit your area. Would it be possible to stay with you for a few days? And the Jewish chef, he says, yes, of course. And he said, I'm just about to finish work. And tonight, I'm having a big party. I'm inviting all my friends. And so the Baal Shem Tov was very excited. He figured, okay, maybe this guy is a hidden tzaddik. They go to the Jewish chef's home. The Baal Shem Tov sees that there's nothing Jewish about it. There's no mezuzah on the door. And all day Friday, he watches this man, and he was a very nice host, gave the Baal Shem Tov and Alexei the best room in his house. He tended to all their needs, but the Baal Shem Tov is getting more and more confused. This guy never davened, he never said a bracha. His house isn't kosher. The Baal Shem Tov was wondering, is he even Jewish? And this is the person who he's going to sit next to in the golden throne, in the highest place in Gan Eden, if he keeps Shabbos the way that he's supposed to? The Baal Shem Tov says, well, tonight is Shabbos. Maybe His Holiness will be revealed on the Holy Shabbos. But this man didn't keep Shabbos in any way whatsoever. He didn't daven. He didn't make Kiddush. And worst of all, he had a big party on Friday night. 
invited all of his friends over. They were smoking cigars and drinking non-kosher wine and playing cards and singing and dancing. <laughs> Pretty much every law that could be broken related to the Holy Shabbos, this guy and his friends broke. The Baal Shem Tov tried to stand in the corner and daven, but he couldn't concentrate with all the noise and the smoke. And he wanted to have his Shabbos meal, but the Baal Shem Tov had assumed that if this is the person he was going to sit next to in Gan Eden, the person who kept Shabbos as it's supposed to be, then he wouldn't have to worry about food. And all he had brought with him was a little bit of bread, some wine and fish, just in case. And while the owner of the house is having a great time with his friends, his non-Jewish friends, having this big party, the Baal Shem Tov was completely miserable all Shabbos. Because after Friday night, of course the house was a mess, and the Jewish chef slept in late, and then got up in the morning and cooked himself some food. And the Baal Shem Tov the whole time is trying to understand what's going on here. It doesn't make any sense. And Moti Shabbos came Saturday night, and the Baal Shem Tov says to his host, My sweetest friend, you've been so kind to me and my driver, but I wonder if you don't mind, can I ask you a question? And he says, yes, of course, any question you want. And the Baal Shem Tov said, why were you and your friends having such a big party on Friday night? Was it your birthday or is it some special occasion? And the man says, holy rabbi, I know you can't tell by looking at me, but the truth is that I'm a Jew and I don't like to think about it. But when I was a child, I was taken from my parents and brought to this city so far away, I could never find them again. And I had no place to go. And I was stuck here in this town, and a non-Jewish family took me in, and they raised me. And I told myself, I know I'm a Jew, and I never want to forget that I'm a Jew, but I'm the only Jew in this whole city. And I was so young when I was taken from my parents. The truth is, Rabbi, I don't know what it means to be a Jew. I just know that I'm a Jew. And I have a few memories of my family back when I was little. One of the things I remember is my father telling me that Shabbos is a time to celebrate with the highest level of joy. And our house was always filled with joy and guests on Shabbos. So Rabbi, I don't have a lot of money. I'm just a chef in a restaurant. And all week long, I eat the leftovers from the restaurant. And I save all of my money for Friday night. Because on Friday night, I do what my parents did. I invite a lot of guests and I have a big party. I serve the best wines and the best cigars and the best foods. And my friend and I sing and play music just like my parents did. And for me, that's Shabbos. And the holy Baal Shem Tov looks at this Jew and he says to himself, Gewalt, how awesome, what an incredible Shabbos this Jew has. He doesn't know any of the halachot, doesn't know any of the laws of Shabbos. And he grew up without any Jews around him in a town where he's the only Jew. And he gets the inside of the inside of what Shabbos is all about. The light and the joy of Shabbos. I can't believe, the Baal Shem Tov says to himself, I can't believe I didn't see it. That's why Hashem sent me to this place. What a Jewish soul this guy has. What a Jewish heart. And then the Baal Shem Tov thought, you know, this guy really wants to live like a Jew, but no one ever taught him. He doesn't know how to live as a Jew. Maybe I should teach him the halachot of Shabbos. Maybe I should teach him to keep kosher, to put on tefillin. And then when he comes to keep Shabbos, he'll do it in such a deep way. The Shabbos is so beautiful, but he only knows one half of it. He only knows the light and the joy. If I taught him the other half, Shmirat Shabbat, how to keep Shabbos according to the law, then wouldn't his Shabbos be on a truly higher level? And the Baal Shem Tov was about to open his mouth and teach this Jew some of the halachot of Shabbos. But to his shock and surprise, he spoke, but no sounds came out of his mouth. He tried again, but he completely lost his voice. And then in his mind, he hears a voice and it says to him, Hey, the Gebal Shem Tov, before you're given the power to speak, think about what you're about to say. It's true that you only have the best intentions, but do you think what you're going to say to this simple Jew is going to help him grow or is going to be his downfall? You want his Shabbos to be complete, but don't you see? He really believes that by having his party and celebrating Shabbos like he thinks his father did, it gives him so much joy. 
What do you think would happen to this man if he found out that all along he was doing everything wrong? And instead of honoring Shabbos, he was actually desecrating Shabbos? What do you think would happen to this pure soul and his heartfelt simcha, his joy? Is it worth it at this stage in his life, knowing his circumstances, to teach him the laws of Shabbos? You realize, hey, the Gabal Shem Tov, you might destroy his spirit and take away his greatest joy. And the Baal Shem Tov thought to himself that he could do both. He could learn the halachot and he could maintain his joy. But since the voice came to him from heaven, he thanked the man for his hospitality and climbed into his wagon while Alexei took the horses and drove him away. And another time, many months later, the Hede Kabbal Shem Tov was once again in a deep meditation. And he says to Hashem, what is the punishment waiting for those people who don't keep Shabbos like they're supposed to? And suddenly he found himself in the lowest places of Geinom, of hell, staring at two blackened, burned thrones. And the Baal Shem Tov says, whose thrones are these? And he's told, one is for you, if chas v'shalom, God forbid you're not wise. And the other is for someone else who you will have to find. And so once again, the Hele Gebal Shem Tov calls on Alexei. He brings the wagon and faces the Baal Shem Tov as the horses ride. And they travel and they travel. And this time they come to a different city. And this one is filled with Jews. As they drove through the crowded streets, the Baal Shem Tov could hear the voices of children learning Torah and smell the Shabbos food being cooked, and the horses stop in front of a house. And there were mezuzot everywhere, and Jews walking in the street everywhere. It was a very Jewish city, and the horses stopped before a house which the Baal Shem Tov learned belonged to a big rabbi, who was actually the head of the largest yeshiva in town. And the Baal Shem Tov walked over to his door and knocked on the door, and the rabbi answers... And he doesn't say a word. And the Baal Shem Tov says, My sweetest friend, my driver and I have been traveling a long time to come to visit you. Would we be able to stay with you for Shabbos? And the rabbi didn't say a word. He simply nodded his head. And then he silently led them into his house. And there, without saying a word, he left the Baal Shem Tov and Alexei sitting in the hallway while the rabbi sat down with a big gemara laying on a table nearby. And for hours the rabbi was learning. In the meantime, the Baal Shem Tov and Alexei are sitting on this uncomfortable bench at the entrance of the house. The whole time, the rabbi is learning, oblivious to his guests and how uncomfortable they are. And only just a few minutes before Shabbos did he show them where they could sleep. And then he quickly ran out the front door to go to shul. And the Baal Shem Tov, being a little confused, he runs after the rabbi. They go to shul, they daven, and immediately when davening is over... And unfortunately, it wasn't the highest davening ever. They come back home to the rabbi's house. And the Hede Gabal Shem Tov right away notices that the Rebbitzin's Shabbos candles are very, very short. They're just like little stubs. And the Baal Shem Tov had to ask her, Holy Rebbitzin, please forgive me if I'm being chutzpadik, but I was wondering, why are your candles so small? Before she could say a word, her husband, the rabbi, says, I want to make sure nobody blows them out, of course or moves them in order to use them to read. Of course, you know these things are forbidden on Shabbos. And he turns away and then goes to the table to make Kiddush. But the rabbi's meal was certainly not the joyous meal that the Baal Shem Tov was accustomed to. It was very short, except for the rabbi saying a few words about the parsha. No one in the family said a word. Nobody sang. Nobody spoke. It seemed to the Baal Shem Tov that the Rebetzin and their children were scared to open their mouths or even move from their chairs. When the meal was over, the rabbi immediately sent the children to bed, and then he sat down on a chair and stayed there absolutely still until he was ready to fall asleep. <sighs> and the next morning he woke up in his chair, except for davening or eating, the rabbi stayed in his chair the whole time. And he barely moved in his chair. And of course, children can't sit in a chair all day. And they would get up and go around the house. But every time they would come near their father, he would shout at them, You can't touch that! It's moksa! Something you can't use on Shabbos! He'd say to them, No, you can't go outside. You might step on an ant, which of course is forbidden on Shabbos. Chas v'shalom, God forbid, you might tear out some grass and leave a hole in the earth. 
And then, for sure, you're a Mechal of Shabbos. You're someone who's breaking Shabbos. And to make a long story short, there was no joy, not one bit of joy, in the rabbi's house that whole Shabbos. And just before Havdalah, the Baal Shem Tov couldn't take it any longer. He says to the rabbi, Holy Rabbi, I'm sorry, but I just don't get it. Why are you yelling at your children? And why are you so silent and sitting in a chair and not moving? And the rabbi said, Coming from such a religious-looking Jew like you, what kind of question is that? You know, I'm sure, that the laws of Shabbos are very intricate and very difficult to keep. And I am a serious Jew, and I'm a good Jew, and I'm very, very careful not to break any halachot, any of the prohibitions. And you know, I'm sure, Rabbi, and I'm sure you know that we're not allowed to speak about weekday matters on Shabbos, but that's a hard thing to do. And so, I never talk on Shabbos. God forbid a word that doesn't belong to Shabbos should slip out of my mouth, and I never go outside, so I won't, God forbid, make a mistake, maybe knock a leaf from a branch or a flower from a bush, or God forbid, crush an insect or something. And I have to teach my children to respect the laws as well. I want them to learn the same awe of heaven and awe of punishment and of God that I myself have. And then the rabbi shut his mouth, scared that maybe he said too much already. And so he resumed, sitting silently and stiffly in his chair. And the Hedek Baal Shem Tov thinks to himself, Wow, Gewalt, what a sad, dark Shabbos this man has. He knows all of the halachot. He does everything right. But there's no joy. There's no Oneg Shabbos. His fear of heaven is so great that he's missing all of the light of Shabbos. And the Baal Shem Tov was about to open his mouth and tell the rabbi what it is to truly have Oneg Shabbos, the bliss of Shabbos. But again, no sound came out of his mouth. And this time he didn't need to hear a voice from heaven. He remembered what it said in the Talmud. person is not supposed to try to teach someone if you think that he can't listen to you. And of course, that's a story I told a couple of weeks ago. And so the Baal Shem Tov decided not to say anything. And when the rabbi made Havdalah, he thanked his host for hosting them and letting them stay for Shabbos, and sadly set off back home to Mejibuz. And so you see, my sweetest friends, we have to have this balance between the joy of Shabbos and the obligation of keeping halacha. And let me tell you, it is so much easier to be strict and sad than to be joyous. Do you think your Yetzirah, your evil inclination, is going to prevent you from being sad? No, it's going to encourage you to be sad. But try to be happy when you want to be sad, and your Yetzirah is going to come kicking and screaming with all of the force and power it has to remind you that you have no right to be happy. What are you being so joyous about? You should be sad. And that's how we fight the Yetzirah, my sweetest friends. By telling you, thank you very much, you're doing your job. But I'm going to choose to be happy. And I'm going to choose to embrace the light of Shabbos and the joy of being a Jew. And so I want to bless you, my sweetest friends. And you bless me back, Bezat Hashem, that we learn the halachot and we know what we're obligated to do as Jews, but that we remember that it's really a tool for us to experience the joy and light that Hashem is pouring down from heaven upon us because we're Jews. We should merit that every Shabbos is a little bit of the Shabbos above and a little bit of the Shabbos below. And when all of the Yidden and all of the Jews in the world get this story, and maybe Bezrat Hashem, before then, will merit the coming of Mashiach Tzidkenu, of the righteous Messiah, who will bring truth into the world. Amen! Amen, Amen brother!
Thank you so much for listening. As always, my sweetest friends, I hope Tisha B'Av was meaningful and not too hard for you. And now we're heading towards Elul. After Av, of course, is the month of Elul, which is the preparation for the high holidays. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, 10 days of Tshuva, Sukkot, Simchat Torah, and Shmini Atzeret. And Be'ezat Hashem will merit to bring in those holidays with joy as well. So thank you for listening, and thank you for being in touch, and thank you for sharing. And I look forward to our next story next week.